Welcome to Tech Raptor. My name is Andrew Stretch. I am sitting here today with Daggle and Sarah Davis Reynolds for Dungeons and Dragons: The Twenty Sided Tavern, a Dungeons and Dragons fully interactive stage show. Um, so, for those who aren't aware of, you know, what this is, you know, I'd love to hear from you guys in your words. What is the Twenty Sided Tavern? The Twenty Sided Tavern is a place and an event. The the place is where we gather to tell stories, and the event is playing a, a, a larger than life, bigger and better than ever game of Dungeons and Dragons, where the audience is basically the fourth player. They uh, mm -hmm. make decisions and they dictate our path and decide ultimately how the story plays out. Yeah, we say that it is playing D and D with five hundred of your closest friends. Except combat <laughs> won't take that long. Don't worry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there are digital games. There's analog games. There are opportunities to call out from your seat or to get up on stage. It's a, it's a, it's a really, really just fun time all around. What was the original inspiration for for putting this together? What was it in your minds that you were like Dungeons and Dragons stage show? These work together. Yeah, so um, so Daggle and I and our third uh, partner, David Carpenter, we've all we all have a different history with Dungeons and Dragons. I've been playing for over a decade. Um, you've also been yeah. playing a really long time, and we were all working together on interactive theater, um, specifically during the pandemic. Actually, we were working on shows that involved a lot of this audience interaction with the technology that David Carpenter has, and so as we were doing other shows that involved this, all of us were like, well. We all like Dungeons and Dragons, and we like what we're doing here. What if we put the two together? Um, and because you know, it, it is that idea of telling a story together. It's so collaborative. The point of Dungeons and Dragons is everyone has a voice at the table, yeah. and so we really thought this was a way to give the audience a way to also have a voice in a way that they maybe don't have just watching other people play. Exactly. There, there are so many there are so many D and D experiences that are sitting and watching people play, which is great. But we were very interested in discovering and uncovering how we could give agency and authenticity uh, to a D and D yeah. comedy and consequences. Yeah. Yeah. That that your choices have consequence. <laughs> consequences for the audience members sometimes sometimes <laughs> if, you, if you yell a really bad npc name out to us we might shame you a little bit <laughs> i mean the first, the first role of the show is an audience member taking you know having having a having a consumable on stage it might be a good thing or might be a bad thing so yeah depending on how they roll <laughs> oh god that's that almost sounds like a threat <laughs> <laughs> it it's almost only a is. little yeah. bit of what <laughs> you spoke briefly about the technology. So, what is it that powers the the interactivity of, or at least the digital interactivity of uh, Twenty Sided Tavern? The digital runs on a technology called Gameotics, and it is a, a browser based, so it's not an app um, technology that you open on your smartphone. Um, you just QR code in, and it lets us send you options to choose between. It lets us send you mini games like tapping on a button a lot of times to fill something up. Um, you're solving riddles by having to like type in the answer. There's a lot of uh, interaction that we can send directly to you. And that allows us to reach all 500 people in the house, as opposed to, you know, the five people we could have brought up on stage. It also means that if you're maybe not as bold and don't want to get brought up mm. on stage, you still get to have a voice. You know, you get to see if we are gonna go down the left path or the right path and you vote for right and you get to see on stage that right bar go up a little bit. So you immediately see that your voice has an impact and it allows you to do that from any seat without having to scream. <laughs> you don't think that 500 people trying to scream out left or right would be a conducive way to steer? What they will do is there will be 500 people screaming NPC names yes. uh, and, and we will figure, we will find one out of that. <laughs> and and some, some, somehow. sometimes singing Sweet Caroline, who knows? Mm -hmm. Once people sit down, kind of, how does the show begin? What is the what is the plot hook and premise that the that the fans will go on? We begin with a bit of onboarding, which is really exciting because it puts everybody on the same page, right? Whether you played D and D or not before, there's still some things that people need to learn about the way that we do it and what it means. So, for everything from the basics of here's what a nat twenty means, here's what a nat one means, to you know, here are some of the specific traditions that we have at the Twenty Sided Tavern, the ways that you can interact. Um, so after that onboarding, they choose the characters that are going to go on the journey, and then the journey itself begins. And this is a brand new um, a campaign set in the Forgotten Realms, where you know, in classic D and D style, we're going to do some riddles, do some combat, and try to save the world. Yeah, awesome. Specifically, the plot hook is there's a corruption in the weave, 
That's all I'm going to say. There's a corruption in the weave that we got to say. Okay. In this, Daggle, you play the DM. So how different is what people will see from a traditional DM or a DM that they'd see in an actual play series to what you're doing on stage um, wrangling everyone? <laughs> that is a really great, great question, term. and it really depends on how you play D&D at home. For me, it's not that different because my at-home games get – a Rowdy. little needing of like, <laughs> well, and in the same way of like, I, I, I personally love that antagonism, that natural sort of antagonism that arises between players and DMs of players going, hey, can I do this? Hey, can I push this boundary? And then the DM having to figure out the way to allow that or the reason why it doesn't serve the story. Because at the end of the day, everything we do at, at, at the 20 Side Tavern or at home playing d d it's all in service of the story and in service of the experience. Um, but I, again, I like to go above and beyond in, in a lot of ways. So I'll, you know, I'll organize you know, fun interactive analog puzzles at home or like clues that lead you all around the house that we're staying at. Um, and so in that way, it's 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 very similar. It's just how how exciting and how funny and how uh, thorough can we make this story? Because at the end of the day, the show that we're doing is a comedy. That doesn't mean it doesn't have stakes and it doesn't have danger and it doesn't have uh, uh, pathos, but it is it is a lot of fun. One difference is you do have more funny wigs here. I do have more wigs here than I have at home. Is that like a lot more funny wigs, or do you already have a lot of funny wigs at home and you just no, have more a lot. on the stage? I actually, that's a great point. I, I I would say at home, mostly I'm you rocking like a hood, maybe. Yeah. But here, I got, ooh, I got a lot yeah, of dozens. wigs back there. <laughs> is, that to, is that to signify the, the many different hats of the NPCs you play? Absolutely, right, because the, uh, the the actors on stage, there are five actors on stage, there's the dungeon master and the tavern keeper, which is Sarah, and so that is the dungeon master in charge of story and the tavern keeper in charge of tech, and then the, the three players who are the, the the player characters that go along the story. And so yes, all the NPCs are, are, are named by the audience and played by the DM in a variety of wigs and beards and hats. And so it may not be as relevant if your DMing style is also similar, but DMing for a stage show, are there any things that you've learned from that experience that you're then taking back to your smaller home games? That's another, this is, yeah, I love, I love this analog. Um, I, I'd say what I've learned from the 20 Side Tavern that I've taken to home games, um, I, I, again, I think they both feed the other. The thing that I, I keep learning is to pivot, is, is to because that's the thing, right? Is e even this campaign, even the campaign at the Twenty Side Tavern, is has milestones. We know we're going from A to B to C. It's really a matter of how we're going to get there. And the number of times that at home or on stage, I get surprised by how someone gets us from A to B, is just is is it, it grows every day. Um, so yeah, I, I would say you know being flexible, not being too precious, um, and um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we often say that um, we want to maintain the capacity for everyone to surprise everyone. And that includes the audience. I think some of our like best surprises have come from the audience in a way that we were not expecting. Moving away from the DM role, Sarah, you're the tavern keeper. What yeah. does that comprise of? That's a, a role not familiar to DM uh, to D &D players. Yeah, so we found that on stage, it was a really helpful to have a duo in charge. Um, it's It's almost like a game show, right? It's helpful to have a two host game show playing off of each other, one who is more in charge of the story and one who is more in charge of the game. It allows the DM to be sort of playfully antagonistic with the players where the tavern keeper can come in and say, no, the DC is still a 15. Giving me puppy dog eyes is not going to change that. <laughs> um, so the tavern keeper is a little bit of the referee. They are the one who knows all the rules and they are the one who at the end of the day, their say goes. Um, it means I and don't then, get in trouble when the players fight back. I say, hey, listen, that's what the tavern keeper said. said. Um, my rules. <laughs> and then the tavern keeper is also sort of that conduit for the audience voice because they are the ones running the technology on stage. So there's a little bit of pivoting and being flexible of saying, we need to do what you know this for the audience. Um, and essentially, the tavern keeper has the toolbox. They have all of the toys that anybody could possibly need to play with, and they know how to best use them. So when the DM says, I want to keep um, you know, this this group of the audience involved in what is going on, Tavern Keeper, what could we do? The Tavern Keeper can recommend a game or recommend a challenge for them to do so that they're still involved. Um, so it's really about knowing everyone's role and then what are the best tools for the job. 
Well, I thought that the DM was the one herding cats, but it turns out that it's the tavern keeper. <laughs> the, the, ta the dungeon master's mic is just turned up a little louder. I was but... going to say, I, I, I frequently find that it is it is the tavern keeper is sort of uh, uh, herding the cats that are the players yeah. and the dungeon master herding the cats that is the, the audience. audience. Um, okay. and again, that is not an exaggeration of 500 people shouting yes. an NPC name at you and going, hmm, I'm sure somebody said something, but that just sounded like a wall, wall of noise. noise. <laughs> Um, you have a stunning cast of characters. Tyler Noah Felix is the fighter. Madeline Murphy is the mage. Diego F. Salinas as, as the rogue. Um, how does rounding out the rest of the party function? You know, we, I've heard about the wall of names, um, but I see that you're also promoting 30 playable characters. Yeah, so each of those characters, the fighter, the mage, and the mm -hmm. rogue, um, have three different characters that they know how to play. So the fighter might have a barbarian, and a paladin and a monk that they could play. And um, then at the beginning of every show, the audience will vote on which character they want to see that night. So we'll say, you know, this monk who is actually John Paul Human Man, who is two halflings in a trench coat, we they vote for four, a four-fisted fighter or something like that. Right. Um, okay. And so that is sort of how it changes every night. The makeup of the party could be completely different based on the characters that are on stage that night. What was it like to boil down some of those kind of more nitty gritty mechanics like combat to make it a faster process for a stage show? What a good question and a big challenge that we yeah, had. Just, it was, it was, yeah, yeah, so it was really in charge of making a lot of the mechanics work for the 20 Sided Tavern, right? And we talk about this all the time. And and we we would have to explain this when we were doing this before it was D&D. &D. And now that it is D&D, &D, um, you know, saying, you know, things like Magic Missile, you got to roll for it. Gotta it's roll it's for still it. got it's still got to have a roll attached to it. It's still got to have the stakes of is this going to be a success or is yeah. this going to be a failure because that's what the whole experience is built on. Um, but it it is it is a fun. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, because as we all know at our home games, combat can be a slog, tedious. tedious, right? Of saying, okay, well, who's rolling? And I'm gonna I could do any you know any of these things, and and it takes forever. And so the performative nature is really important for us because at the end of the day, it is a show. It and specifically, it's a two hour show where we have to tell a whole story. So there's only so much time that we can give to combat. Um, and so it's a lot about telling a story through combat and saying, all right, we know we have to have a role for everything in order to have those stakes. Are we gonna be successful or not? And there's a lot of following the journey. Are the players doing really, really well? Are all of them getting really good hits? That's going to be a pretty satisfying combat. Whereas if they're failing and that, you know, the big bad is just going to town on them, that's going to be a very different sort of satisfying story that we're telling of, you know, maybe the underdogs coming up from the top. Um, but it's a lot of balance of saying, how do we take the mechanics as they exist in 5e, because this is built on 5e, and how do we make that interesting to watch for, I would say the longest combat ever goes is 20 minutes. Yeah, something like that. Well, and and the reality of an experience like this is whether it's combat or a puzzle or anything, we also always have to have, the story has to continue. Right? It's not mm -hmm. a video game, it's not an at-home campaign. There's there's no there's no game over screen. We can't be 40 minutes in the experience and go, <laughs> I'm sorry, you're part of the PCK. I mean, you said that there were consequences for the audience. Right. Surely losing the campaign would be a consequence. <laughs> I think it depends yeah. on your definition of losing, right? Yeah. So yes, we have to we have to get to the end of the campaign, but what kind of story did you tell? Yeah. Did you what kind of world did we leave behind? Yeah. Um did we leave it for better or did we make things actually worse? Most DMs will only need to craft an adventure to run it once or twice, and you know, they've just got the few people at their table. How different was the approach to crafting the story to you know to balance the flexibility that an audience member might come twice versus not absolutely losing control of what's going on. That structure, like we mentioned earlier, of we know we're going from A to B to C is very helpful, but the reality is we are building six shows every time we build one. This is the fifth campaign that we've written for the 20 Sided Tavern, and it, it, it is pretty statistically and mathematically unlikely to impossible that we're ever gonna see the same story twice. It would be very difficult to follow the same path twice, especially with this one. It, it is just, it is so broad and so deep and has so many if thens and variables yeah. and, and and optional uh, paths, um, and then obviously with the 
nature of the show and the way that the performers are, you know, in terms of uh, party composition and the choices that the audience is going to be making, it's just, it's a completely different experience every time. Yeah, there are unlockable moments that may or may not happen in your show based on how well you're doing or how poorly you're doing, or depending on which path you took, you might get a completely different obstacle um, than you might otherwise. I think so. there was one room in Chicago that we never went to or like yes, went to we never saw the mouse in chicago oh we never saw the mouse npc oh my gosh yeah and we were there for 12 weeks so <laughs> <laughs> well who was the mouse who was the mouse npc if now is the time to tell people what they missed out on he was a little i mean he was just a little he wanted to help he's out a, with the, he's the treasury yeah yeah and and uh <laughs> Never, they never got to. They He's a little them. carnival mouse. He, he was like a he had little mouse. carnival games, um, like the big hammer and everything. Was, yeah, that's a true part of being a DM as well. Prepping thirty oh. minutes for a single section and then just that's yes. useless. Obviously, we have those in in our own minds of like, oh man, I really hope we go to this room today because that is one of my favorite rooms. And then we don't. It's like, oh okay, never mind. We'll go somewhere else. <laughs> Going through five different campaigns, are there any like rooms and puzzles that you've like? that haven't come up in one that you've just like put a pin in to be like that can show up later we not we haven't done this yet we're actually working on another campaign shush, shush. a little exclusive there and the the base mechanic of that one i'm very excited to explore it's a mechanic we've never used before um and i think that's the thing that we, we learn these base mechanics for all of these campaigns mm -hmm. and we get to build on what we learn and then also try brand new things um we're also always looking for ways to just expand the toolbox right yeah. like uh as of right now you know as the party uh, you know continues and grows and gains experience they they do so all together but now we're you know as, as we're continuing to brainstorm we're going maybe we can make an asymmetrical experience where one of the mm -hmm. cohorts you know levels up and the others don't or like how do we how do we you know um how do we just just completely make the experience as asymmetrical as yeah. possible are there any, you know, any uh, mechanics or experiences that currently, like you're thinking, we want to do that, but right now it's not feasible, whether it be in the digital tool set or just hmm. the feasibility of people on stage? A good question. Someday I want to have axe throwing on stage. Like actual axe throwing? Like actual axe throwing. Because yeah. again, we have analog games where people come up and they play. Mm -hmm fantasy beer pong or a similar sort of analog game and i think at a different scale someday i think yeah. it'd be great to to do a fan a fantasy axe throwing or one of those rock climbing walls that's like a treadmill yeah. with rock climbing because <laughs> um, we've really upped you know fr yeah, from from the past productions this has really become a premier production with just a, a a massively improved set design and the lighting and the video and 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 the magic and it's all it's yeah. it's it's all huge now and we'll just continue to get bigger i am very excited to explore asymmetrical goals mm. um so right now the party has one you know same goal finish the quest mm -hmm. um, i'm very excited to give the cohorts other goals um so maybe the fighters know that they want to do the most damage in combat and so the players in the audience are always going to be angling for the choices that mean the fighter gets to do more damage so i'm, I'm interested in like playing with some asymmetry in um intention we're a big game we're obviously big game players we love a secondary objective yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so a secondary objective and sometimes the third Ooh. um and you said it earlier one of the one of the analog games was the fantasy beer pong what exactly makes the beer pong fantasy what makes it fantasy is the 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 the, the way it is a mechanic yeah. for the fantasy telling right it's not just an arbitrary hey let's go up and play a game it is this moment that we're trying to depict doesn't we, we we don't just want to tell you about it we want you to feel it we want you to become a part of it um and that's what sort of like integrates it into yeah. becoming fantasy beer pong yeah you have had performances in chicago pittsburgh and the edinburgh fringe festival yes. um are there any particular funny or chaotic anecdotes that you can share that might clue some people watching this into kind of what what weirdness they may expect the first one that jumps to mind is that uh, again so you'll learn this in your onboarding we we have a, a Whenever someone rolls a nat 20, they get to take a shot of celebration. And whenever someone rolls a nat 1, they take a shot of shame. And in Chicago, the shot of shame was Malort. And if you know what Malort is, then you know how nasty Malort is. And somehow, uh, despite all odds, Malort has made it back onto the New York stage. So we'll be torturing ourselves again in that way. Yes. Um, other anecdotes. Other anecdotes. I mean, again, just things that the audience does. There was one show in Chicago that there were twins there um, for their bar mitzvah, and they were screaming an NPC name at us 
the whole time. And we finally heard it and grabbed it. And I said, that sounds like a real name. That is a proper name. And so I very quickly Googled on stage to see who the real name was to make sure that like, if we used it, it was all okay. And it was the prime minister of Luxembourg. Of Luxembourg, yeah. And I don't know why these twins were so obsessed with the prime minister, <laughs> but they were. And so this NPC became that name and their entire arc for that show became about politics, which that NPC was not written to do. Um, but again, <laughs> gave us and ran with it. That, um, that, was, that was one of my yeah. favorites in the beginning of Chicago too, was a character got a name that was a very French sounding name. So that character who, that NPC who had been written to have a Southern dialect ended up using that same vocabulary with a French dialect. And if you've never tried to say y'all with a French accent, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> very Cajun. <laughs> it did turn very Cajun, you're yeah. right. That's fantastic. So uh, previews start April 19th. The do. official opening is May 5th. Yes. Um, is there any last things you would like to, to say about the show, to share about the show uh, for people who are interested? There is so much care put into every part of this. We are huge nerds and huge D&D fans and like this is made by by nerds for nerds really. And so we're just we're so excited to have folks join us and find all the little easter eggs that we have everywhere and just, you know, come come play games and tell stories with us. Yeah, that's it. That's perfect. Okay. Fantastic. Well, thank you guys so much for taking the time today to to chat with us at Tech Raptor and uh, you know, we'll we'll look forward to uh, to your show. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Thank you so much.